Well, welcome, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all here on behalf of the Center for the Study of World Religions. Uh, we are located across the street, uh, and after this event, uh, we, we're going to have a reception for all of our guests, our panelists, and for all of you. So please join us uh, for a reception at the Center uh, after, after this event. We're here, as you know, uh, to convene a panel conversation honoring Jacques Houdinet's book, the Human Face of Globalization for Multicultural to Mestizaje. Here it is, and it is for sale at the Divinity School Bookstore. <laughs> uh, the book is a challenge to both a simple multiculturalism on the one hand and to cultural wars on the other. This fall, the Center for the Study of World Religions inaugurated its Religion in Politics series with the panel discussion on American national identity. At that occasion, David Carrasco articulated a provocative rejoinder to Samuel Huntington's book, a rejoinder that embraced inclusiveness and rejoiced in diversity rather than focusing on anxiety about what defines American national identity. The event tonight, I think, sounds a similar positive note in foregrounding the human face of globalization and celebrating Mestizaje, the mixing of races and cultures. We're very grateful to David for organizing the event. This evening also caps what has been a full day of discussions that have explored Latino leadership in politics, education, and religion. David will introduce this evening's speakers, but let me first make just a few remarks about him. David is the Neil L. Rudenstein Professor of the Study of Latin America, and he holds a joint appointment at, here at the Divinity School and with the Department of Anthropology. A historian of religion specializing in Mesoamerican religions and the American-Mexican borderlands, David founded and directs the Moses Mesoamerican Archive and Research Project. His publications on the symbolic nature of cities, ritual violence, and sacred space and the formation of the colonial regions of Mesoamerica have grown out of more than 20 years of archaeological and archival study and research. David's work on the religious dimensions of the Latino experience has included the subject, subjects of mestizaje, the myth of Aztlan, transculturation, and the Virgin of Guadalupe. He co-produced the film Alhambrista, the director's cut, which puts a human face on the life and struggles of undocumented Mexican farm workers in the United States. And he authored the book, Alhambrista and the U.S.-Mexican Border. His recent contributions to our understanding of Mesoamerican history and culture include Montezuma's Mexico, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Mesoamerican Cultures, and City of Sacrifice, the Aztec Empire and the role of violence in civilization. Earlier, I used the word celebrate in talking about mestizaje, and that's another important dimension of David's work here at Harvard. Two brief examples. He curated a living altar of the Day of the Dead as an exhibit at the Peabody Museum and a three-day celebration of Our Lady of Guadalupe and the Latin American religious experience. The Mexican government recently celebrated David by awarding him the highest decoration that that government can bestow on a foreign national, the Order of the Aztec Eagle. We're especially grateful to David for being a member of our advisory board at the Center for the Study of World Religions, and we want to thank him very much for organizing this evening's panel. Please join me in welcoming David Francois. Donald is so, is so generous because I hardly show up for the meetings. So, so he was, maybe he was trying to say, hey, man, <laughs> come over to the meetings once in a while since you're on the committee. Thank you very much, Donald, and the Center for the Study of World Religions, and Miss Rebecca Klein does such a fantastic job of taking care of uh, all the events that take place uh, and has really helped us put together tonight's presentation. 
how you keep so much poise is beyond me, but it's really impressive, the work and the poise. So thanks a lot for all that. Uh, it has been a long day. We just came from this program over at the uh, Kennedy Center, and one of the one of the events I want to reflect upon just for a moment is that the first panel of three panels that we had was on religion, that no, was on politics and Latinos and leadership. And it was chaired by David Gergen. And they brought in these heavy hitters from D.C. They brought in some people from the White House. It was strange because they were Latinos working in the White House. <laughs> and there were these two Republicans and then there was two Democrats. And the Republicans were in a sort of frenzy of bragging about how effective they'd been with the Latinos. And it was so funny because we were there and the Democrats who were there, the two Democrats, kept saying, well, we, you know, our, our party just doesn't get it about how to get into the Latino community. We just, we just can't get it. Uh, and then Professor uh, Audunay spoke and Elizondo spoke, and it was clear that the way you want to get Latinos involved in your political party is to have a big event around the Virgin of Guadalupe. <laughs> because if you have an event around the Virgin of Guadalupe, at least 40,000 Latinos will show up for that event. And the Democrats really woke up. So this may be the biggest contribution you made today <laughs> to fighting back against what's going on. Um, this evening's uh, event is around a uh, conversation around this remarkable book called The Human Face of Globalization from multicultural to mestizaje. And as a way of bringing on the book to you, I wanted to read a paragraph of something I said earlier today, because one line from this comment that I made kept getting quoted later in uh, the events. This was my opening comment. And it's a way of, of getting into this remarkable word and the position that Jacques Adonai takes in this book uh, the human face of globalization from multicultural to mestizaje. What is this strange word? And what does it mean? How powerful is it? Um, and I said, um, they asked me to say something about the word Latino to start it off. And I said, listen to this series of words <coughs> of names and self-naming. Latinos, Latinas, Latinoas, Hispanos, Hispanics. Boricuas, Chicanos, Chicanas, Mestizos, Indo-Afro-Euro-Americans, all of them Latinos. And you note the tension that exists between them in this excerpt from a song by Dr. Loco's Rocking Jalapeno Band. When singing about contemporary Latina women activists, he croons, some label her Hispanic, but she's not one to panic. She's pura revolucionaria. To me, these multiple names mean, first of all, that they're creative ways for the children of Latin American diasporas to say affirmatively, we are here. We are all here. Todos estamos aquí. We share languages, colonial histories, some foods, practices of courtship and romance, love of homeland and hopes in this land. We share traditions of hard work and creative imaginations. But we are not all the same. From Alaska to Magellan, from San Juan to Seattle, from California to New York, we Latinos, Hispanos, call us what you will, are part of the most significant demographic transformation in the history of the United States. And we hope we are here to help make this new demography work for a better democracy. We are here, and our diversities promise to challenge and enrich this democracy. Now, the expression of these names, in part, is what this book is about. And let me just run through very quickly the, the titles of the chapters in this book as a way of introducing you to Jacques Adonais. The first chapter is called Diversity, Geography, and Cultures. The second chapter is called From Multicultural to Mestizaje. And it has a very important section that is central to Jacques Adonais' approach 
And that section is entitled Recognizing Differences. This whole idea of recognition is very important to this question of how Mestizaje works. He has also a chapter called The Vocabulary of Mestizaje, which includes the vocabulary of marginality, the scale of colors, and from contempt, and here's that word again, recognition. Then he has a chapter called Mestizaje Recognized. So he keeps coming back to this notion of recognition, recognized. And he has a subtitle, Inescapable Diversity, a desired totality between body and dream. Then he has a chapter called A History, and he's got H-I, you know, in parentheses, a <coughs> history of desire and violence, because in his view, this violence is fundamental to the story of Mestizaje. Then he has a section called Democracy, Rupture, and Turning Point, where he deals with Cornelius de Paul, who believes Mestizaje doesn't exist, he talks about the mestizaje of Arthur de Gobineau and also Alexis de Tocqueville. Then he has a chapter called The Transformation of Bonds, which is very much what it seems to me his notion of mestizaje is about. Then he has a chapter called Symbology Shattered. And then finally, a wonderful title of a chapter, A Memory with a Future. And then finally, A Paradigm for humanity. Now, one of the things I want to raise for you when you think about and react to and get into a critical conversation with the panel about the notion of mestizaje is think about the way in which race discourse has been dominated in this culture for the last hundred years and longer. I mean, we know a hundred years or so ago, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, our man, said the biggest, the main problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And the color line he was talking about largely was the black-white color line, although W.B. Du Bois was smart enough to know there were other shades of colors and so forth. But that position, that the black-white relationship is the way to talk about race and ethnicity in this country, has just dominated as such a powerful position. Even though folks are aware of the, you know, of the subtleties in there, it's just so interesting to me, and certainly here at Harvard, with the work of Cornell West uh, and other folks up there in the Afro-American religious, stud Afro -religious African-American studies, this whole question of the color line and the black-white, this is really powerful. This is really powerful. And all of a sudden we have here now coming on this demography, all this new demography that comes in and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't try to destroy the black-white position, but you have, first of all, in the work of Virgil Elizondo, a remarkable book that came out some years ago called The Future is Mestizo. The future is not the black-white struggle. The future is Mestizo. Places where cultures meet, translated into a number of languages, republished, starting to reflect upon a little nowhere place called San Antonio, Texas, as a place where messages come that suggest to us there's alternative ways of talking about race discourse in this country. And that these alternative ways of talking about race discourse in this country have been for the most part occluded by what Charles Long calls the dynamics of concealment. Hmm? Now you understand, of course, that the black-white dichotomy was not created by black people. It was created and benefited white people. And of course then black people took it up and started to use it to benefit themselves. Uh, but here comes uh, Elizondo and says, no man, the future is mestizo. As a matter of fact, the past has been mestizo. Hmm? We also have, fortunately, on the panel a surprise guest tonight. My main man, John Philip Santos, the author of that great memoir, Places Left Unfinished at the Time of Creation, which is a family history, a family about sadness, a story about sadness and triumph, which is all about mestizaje, all about mestizaje, and he'll be hearing from him as well. Uh, Jacques Adonne is here, and he's going to talk with you about this, and we're so fortunate to also have someone who's asked that she go last. She says, I have a woman's perspective. I want to go last. Mm -hmm. Olga... Kaufman, who was born in Mexico in the state of Tamaulipas, reared in South Texas, and very involved in uh, many of these issues, and I'll introduce her more fully uh, later. But they're going to take us through, in a sense, a reflection upon the claims that not only is the future mestizo, but the human face of globalization is a mestizo face, is a face of mestizaje. So we're very fortunate to have both Jacques Adonai here talking with us, uh, but also these people who are going to be responding. We're going to give you time. 
But I know some folks here have been thinking about this black-white discourse for some time. they got some things to say. So Jacques, tell us about the book and what it is you're trying to teach Thank us. you. Well, we'll move that over close. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have to t- <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for your presence. And thank you, Professor Carrasco, for his invitation and the organization of this evening. Thank you to the Center for World Religion and the director of the Center. Somebody asked me one day, how, many, how much time did, you, did it take you to write this book? And I just answered, six months and 30 years. <laughs> six months because I began writing one morning as a protest. Uh, one morning while I was shaving and I was listening to the radio and there was a man in France named Le Pen, you know, who was very racist and he, he, was, he was speaking a bit against immigration and that we had to send back all the immigrants to the country and so on. And I was just thinking, but what can I do, you know? Of course, I can go to the streets and protesting against racism, but that won't be very effective and I am a little bit too old in order to do that, you know. But I suddenly thought, but I have in my files a lot of data which can be used against a man like this because it's not enough to protest against racism. When you protest against racism, you are protesting for what? I am against racism, but I am for what? And I did not have any answer. What is the opposite of racism? What is the positive value which is opposed to us. We say tolerance, but this is very vague, you know. And suddenly I thought, but the opposite of racism is mestizaje, you know. And I began to think about that, and of course I had a lot of things in my fight, and I must confess that it led me much further than I, than I had ever thought, you know. And it, much, it led me 30 years backward when I met Virgil, in San Antonio, Texas. That's another story. But I began to work with him in the Mexican-American Cultural Center. At the time, I was just a white man, a French man, and I was discovering the world. And I realized that the, the world was much richer than I ever thought, that there were colored people, that there were all kinds of culture, you know. And that somehow I, feel, I felt deprived of being only a white man, you know, and a European. And little by little, talking and working with Virgil, you know, a lot of things came to my mind. And one of the points which, along those 30 years, were always interested me was, how is it possible to grasp the diversity of mankind, you know? The concept we have, all the concepts, whether in philosophy, whether in history, whether in cultures, are, the majority of them are exclusive concepts, which means that when I want to name the identity of an individual or the identity of a group, I name it as opposed to another one. I am white and against or not black. I am a man, not a woman. I am a European, not. But in the, if you analyze our language, and it, this is typical especially in human sciences, the majority of the concepts in human sciences are exclusive concepts, you know, which means that when we name something, we let aside a lot of other things we cannot name because the, the instrument of our conceptualization is not relevant. Therefore, the first part of this book, you know, is somehow about the conceptualization of mestizaje. You know, the titles David Carrasco uh, read a moment ago. You know, just try, try. Uh, it tried to, the, the chapters try to deal with the concept of multiculturalism, uh, the concept of uh, diversity, the concept of culture, you know, and I try to analyze how those concepts function in our discourse, you know, and how they are relevant and they are not relevant, you know, because they name reality and also at the same time they exclude part of reality, you know. And one of the most interesting chapter, chapter and I was fascinated by it because it was a discovery. It came from one of my students, you know, a, a young woman who was who is part German, part French. You know, and I was teaching about that, you know, and so, uh, one day she came to see me and she, she wanted to write a paper. And she's she's a linguist, 
and she just went through the dictionaries trying to find the, the relevant vocabulary to name the in-between identity. How can I name a, a human being who is neither white nor black, who is, who is in between? She went through all the dictionaries in English, in French, in German, and so on. And the result of this investigation, I mention it here, is that of ordinary vocabulary to name these real, in-between realities, is always a negative vocabulary. The vocabulary of mestizare is negative. In all the men, think of English, for instance, huh? half breed, uh, bastard. You have, of course, you, uh, you you have words. You know, uh, I give the list. You know, but all those, there is no one positive word to name the reali the reality of the ident mestizo identity. That's something. The only culture where the word mestizo is positive is Mexico. Como Mexico no hay dos. And there is an orgullo the, of the Mexican identity, of the mestizo identity. Although, uh, it, when you go to Mexico, when you live in Mexico, you have to nuance, you know, <laughs> because I give in the other chapter all the vocabulary uh, studied by Murner about, you know, the, the degrees of mestizaje, which is a very pejorative vocabulary. But, you know, the, the first part gathered some data about the way we name, we look at mestizaje. And the second part, somehow, the other chapters, come to an analysis of the reality of mestizaje, an analysis to history, hmm? uh, because I, I, deep, I knew that, you know, I had a lot of data, but I tried to systematize, to systematize a little bit more how mestizaje has been seen through history. But it's amazing, because from the beginning, from the Greeks, you know, they have words to name those who are neither Greeks, nor, you know, they are, they are the Metics, and so on, you know. Don't, so history, uh, and uh, there is a place to Alexander, you know, and the experience of Alexander the Great, you know, who wanted a mixture of the people. And, uh, you know, there is also a chapter on biology. How does biology name, you know, the intermediary, intermediary beings, you know, which comes out from uh, biological experience. And now, uh, when you talk with biologists, mestizaje is a basic phenomenon. You know, there is no biology without some kind of mixture, and you, you, are, you don't have any pure race, pure biological identity. You know. Therefore, uh, there is a chapter on that. Uh, but what I call the turning point is when I arrive not at the biological approach nor the historical approach, but the philosophical approach. Oh, it doesn't work. No, a little closer to you, please. Okay. Oh, sorry. I, excuse me, you should protest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I come to the philosophical approach, because I discovered that there, there has been a lot of work written about uh, miscegenation, hybridation, mestizaje. And on that, there is a key author who an Apile is a French author, which is known, who is known all over the world, at least for, he is known by the philosophers, you know, uh, and his name is Gobineau. Arthur Gobineau is, is a great mind, you know, he's a brilliant man, he was a very cultivated mind, he traveled all over the world, he, he was uh, the representative of France in the Central Asia in the, in the middle of the 19th century, and he, he was it was corresponding to that period, you know, uh, he was trying to build up a theory of the diversity of humanity, which is a beautiful project. But in order to give an account of the diversity of humanity, he compares, you know, the races, as he says, you know, and he arrives to the conclusion that there is an in inequality of races. And this inequality of races comes from the inequality of blood. You have the pure blood of the white man and the impure blood of the black man. And according to the proportion of the mixture of white and b black blood, you have higher or lower cultures. You know. He writes four books about that. You know, it's a big work. There are not many people who read it now, but it's interesting to read it because he has a, a, la a mass of data corresponding to the middle of the 19th century. Those data are interesting. But the whole theory he applies to those data is totally wrong, you know. And which is interesting is that Gobineau, at one point, was the secretary of Tocqueville, 
when Tocqueville was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France. And Gobineau sent this book to Tocqueville in uh, 1951, uh, uh, 1851, excuse me, 1851, yeah, in the 19th century, 1851. He sent this book to Tocqueville, and the week after, Tocqueville answered to him, telling him, I cannot accept the, your theory. You know, your theory is wrong. You know, and they had a correspondence, we had a correspondence, Tocqueville defending the human freedom, human equality in the name of democracy and liberty, and Gobineau trying to uh, defend his, his thesis. I published part of this correspondence, some, some except. But what I realized during that is that many people spontaneously still have in mind the ideas of Gobineau. They still have in mind that there are inequalities in mankind and these, those inequalities are, are measured according to the color of the skin. You know? That is the second part. You know? And the third part, I try to enlarge the, the, the point of view because when you look at mestissari, when you look at this in-between human being, when you look at what comes out from the differences between human beings, you realize that the whole humanity is made of differences which combine one with another. And that therefore it gives you a real, a new point of view, you know, to appreciate, uh, for instance, the problem of the borders. We always identify people with the border. Either you are on one side or you are on the other side. But there are more and more people who are in between, who cross the border. One day they are on one side, the other day they are on the other side. And the problem of the immigrants in our country is the problem of the illegals and so on, you know. Therefore, we need a new look at the borders and what, to what I call the space, the in-between spaces, you know. We need in-between spaces in life. I work with young immigrants in France and with some illegal immigrants, you know. But those people need some space just to brace, you know, just to, to exist, to survive. And of course, they have to go through all kinds of, uh, you know, procedures. And some of them uh, remain a long time, you know, in, the, in this in-between. But all of her, us, we need this in-between. Could you tell me about this in-between space, about the birth project? Oh, yeah. That would be an interesting example for them. That, that's another I example. I should have introduced you to that project. Yeah, yeah. That's another, it's a, it's another project in my life. Uh, you know, I, I, during 20 years I taught uh, uh, social anthropology in La Sorbonne, you know. And uh, I retired a few years ago, but my colleagues invited me again to participate to a project we have. The project, in fact, started with some medical doctors. Because in the French hospital, we have a lot of people coming from all over the world, and French pregnant women who come, you know, uh, to give birth to their child. But the fact is that 20 years ago, the, the, doc the doctors knew how to speak to a woman, you know. They just were, were giving prescription, you have to do that, that, and that, you know. And, of course, they understood what they were saying because they were a kind of common uh, Western scientific culture. But now, with women coming from Africa, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, they just realize that they cannot speak the same way. Why? Because the birth of a child is not perceived and lived and symbolized in the same way if the woman comes from Southeast Asia, if she comes from India, from Africa, and so on. Therefore, the doctors came to us and told us, could you help us, thanks to the history of culture, to try to understand how birth is lived in a different, in the different culture. What is birth for a Buddhist? What is birth, uh, the birth of a child for a Muslim? What is birth? And we, we began sharing cases, you know, a <laughs> case study on birth. And after that, we tried to theorize the thing. The book has been published. We are still going on, on uh, continuing the project, you know. But somehow, you see, birth, which seems to be the basic common experience of mankind, is on the one hand common, and on the other hand, totally different according to the cultures, you know. And we, you have, for those women, for them, for their families, because it's also a problem of we need some intermediary spaces. And now in some hospital, they have created that kind of space. When, uh, just one example, when a woman with a problem, she discussed with the, uh, the doctor, her husband, she was Muslim, and the imam, in order to make a decision, you know. 
and she made the decision, uh, you know, but after such a process in between, where, when nobody knew what would happen, at the end she, she kept the boy, the, the baby, you know. But, well, that's kind of experience, you know. But I, I, you could say the, the, the same thing about symbols. There are some, is there a common grammar of symbols for man? That's a big problem I want. But the basic symbol of mankind, which are related with the human body, you know, are lived, represented, spoken in different ways according to the culture. Which means that you, you can translate and you cannot translate, you know. And, and the child who is born from two different parents, he has to deal with these differences, you know, because he's a child with mestizo. The, 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 the father comes from one place on earth, the, uh, the mother from another place, you know. Uh, the, 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 ch the child has to adjust himself, you know, or herself. Therefore, symbol, symbology chatted, you know, and, and Mestisari brings a new vision of the body, which amazes me, is that in all the sociological surveys we have uh, with the immigrants, the key problems which always come out are the same, you know, food and cuisine, marriage and, and, uh, and uh, the right to marry and, and religion. To rights, cuisine, rights, and marriage, it deals with the body. You know, what makes people communicate are not the ideas. First. These are, are the, these basic symbols, which are the symbols of the body, which allow communication very often in ambiguity. But the, the symbol functions because it is ambiguous. You know? And after that came more or less the clarifying of ideas. That's something else. And comes also the point of time, what I call the memory of the future. Because in order to survive in our society, we have to reinterpret permanently our past. And the past of mankind, and especially the Mestizo past, is a violent past. How to survive to violence. And when I began to think of that, I realized that every one of us in our own history, personal history, or in our collective history, the history of our group, we have had to go through violence. As somebody told me one day in this country, and I think it's Virgil who told me that, you know, our grandmothers have suffered, but we are alive. You know, what is the link between the two? You see, time, space, body, the three basic coordination. Uh, Mm, mm, clues of identity. And just the end is that for me, Mestisache is a paradigm of humanity. Therefore, uh, and I try to say that uh, in a small book, you know, it's not that big with some example, but I must say that I was transformed myself in writing that book. Before I was just a French man, a white man. No, I don't know that much who I am, but I, I know that I'm on the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So next we'll hear from Virgilio Elizondo. Virgilio, as I said, has written this wonderful book called The Future is Mestizo. His most recent book is called A God of Incredible Surprises. Um, Virgilio was the vicar of the San Fernando Cathedral during the real fluorescence of that cathedral, and he's the one who developed um, this, um, I call it the Mariachi Mass. It was more than that, uh, that has been uh, televised and shown to countries all over the world because of its mestizo, mestizo uh, character. He was recently named by Time Magazine as one of the leading spiritual innovators uh, in the United States. Um, and he's been working with Jacques Adonai for many years, uh, and he has some thoughts on this book. But Helio. Thank you, David. It's a great pleasure to be with you here again, and especially this, to introduce Jacques' book, because Jacques and I have worked together for so many years, and I'd like to give you just a very quick anecdote of our meeting together. Uh, we first met in Colombia at the now famous Medellin Conference of 1968 when Jacques had made a presentation and he was a superstar and I was just assist, I was just a secretary to my archbishop there who simply went along because I could translate. That was my only qualification. But anyway, on the way back, uh, we just accidentally, one of God's surprises, uh, just like the last election of the last pope is a surprise. But anyway, uh, 
uh, we were on the same line in the airport to get on a plane together, so we got seats together, and there were a three-seater. We had my archbishop with me. Uh, he sat on the window, I sat in the middle, and Jack sat on the side. And my archbishop very piously read his breviary on the way back. And Jack and I very piously enjoyed Manhattans. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about Mestizaje. That was, that was our first conversation in 68. And we started talking about different aspects of Mestizaje. And we talked about something that for me has become a pivotal moment in my own self-understanding of who I am and a lot of the basis of a lot of my own work, Future Mestizo and other works. We talked about the famous inscription in Mexico City in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas where the final battles took place between the Spaniards uh, and their allies and the native um, Aztecs and their people. And it was, as you know, very bloody battles and very painful and cruel and violent. But there on, on that plaza was the inscription uh, that really transformed my way of thinking and had been the basis of my own thought, where it said, um, on, on this site, on the sad night of August 13th, 1521, uh, valiantly taken by Cortes, heroically defended by Cuauhtémoc, it was neither a defeat nor a victory, but the painful birth of the mestizo people who is Mexico today. And to be able to change my, my thought pattern from the either or, the oppressor, oppressed, victim, victimized, the conquer, conquered, to be able to, go, to change from those categories of the either or to the category of birth. Uh, and birth comes through pain, there are birth pains. And yet without the birth pains, there's no birth. Uh, and to be able to transfer that to the birth of a people, to, to the whole birth of a people, that, that could transcend the either or, not by destroying it, but by, by transcending it as a child transcends the parents. It doesn't destroy the parents, but the child goes beyond the parents. And so to transform that, see that as the birth of a people. Uh, and to see that as an inclusiveness. And so that started our friendship was around Mestizaje. And, you know, we worked together, thanks to Jack, as I went to France to do my doctorate, because he's the one that challenged me. He's the one that challenged me, look, you've got to keep working this thought. You've got to keep deepening it. You've got to keep exploring it. And many times I would ask him, say, well, you got me to come here. Now tell me what to do. You know, he said, no, it's your work. <laughs> you know, uh, it's your work. You've got to figure it out. And he was a great conversation partner, but he was not about to do it for me, which was great. And I had other friends. So we worked together this whole notion of mesti that there was something profound in mestizaje that we sort of said, because I had struggled as a Mexican-American growing up in San Antonio, Texas, growing up in the Mexican barrio, totally Mexican, then going to... English-speaking school, very, very Catholic, but Irish Catholicism. Uh, so, having crossing that border every day, crossing that border every day from from two totally different worldviews, you know. And I kept asking, "Am I this? Am I that? Who, who am I supposed to be?" Even my name, you know, teacher school pronounced Virgilio. So, so they, I became Virgil. And in those days, you don't question the teacher. Teacher said it. That's it, you know. So when I would cross the street, I was Virgil. When I crossed it back, I was Virgilio. And I grew up simply not, you know, that just became normal. They didn't even think twice of it. So, so we worked together, and to see that in Mesisaka, <laughs> there was a possibility of really something new and exciting. I remember in Octavio Paz, many years ago, an article he wrote on the, on the difference between Mexico and the United States. It was in this article in Daddy Lust, many years ago, uh, we did the difference on the basis of gastronomy and eroticism. Is that the two basic tenets of humanity. Without one of those two, humanity comes to an end. You've got to eat and you've got to produce babies. So he said, without those two, we don't continue. So he said, but he wrote about that border as the border between absolute otherness. That each one was the absolute other of the other. Well, I didn't think I was the absolute other of anyone. Uh, but I realized that there was two things in me, but it was not two persons. And so again, with Jack's help, we continued to, to pursue the whole notion that Mesisaje was, that the border was not the border between absolute otherness, but it was actually the cradle of a new humanity. It was actually the cradle of a new humanity. It was bringing people, and yes, in a painful way, often very painful ways, many times, and yet something new that could be celebrated. And so therefore the fiesta notion. So I think that, that the whole notion of responding both bodily and spirit, because as Jack said, Mesisaje comes through the body. And that's where it's a big difference between multiculturalism. 
It comes through the body, and there is that, that coming together of peoples and, and something new being born. I'd just like to finish saying something. Jack and I worked together many years, and it's been a, a great conversation partner. We had a great week in Mestizaje, where really Jack and David met in San Antonio, and it was a marvelous conversation that actually, in many ways, got into this book later on. In fact, the title came out of the conference. The Human Face of Globalization from the Culture to Mestizaje. I just thought I'd finish with this. His book is also in other languages. It's also in Italian. And it's provoking a tremendous amount of discussion at the Roman universities right now. As you know, the universities in Rome and Catholicism bring students from all over the world. Uh, the last time I taught in Rome, in, in my classroom, I had people in the English section of the course. I had people from 33 different nations in the class. So, it, I mean, when you teach in Rome, you really get, you really are teaching a world audience. Uh, and, and, it, and they teach in different language sections. Well, I just found out from a friend of mine who's doing his doctoral dissertation on Mestizaje and doing a passing doctoral dissertation that the big bus run there among many of the students is Jack's books on Mestizaje uh, because it, it, it is responding to something that they have to struggle with every day. Uh, are they Ethiopian or are they Italian Catholics? Are there Nigerians or are they this? Are they this? And to be able to work at something where they can say, yes, I'm both, but something different. It says a tremendous liberation, a tremendous liberation of the spirit. So I think his work is going to make a great contribution. Uh, for me, it's an example of, of people of, that are different working together. Jacques is very, very French. Uh, and I'm very, very Chicano, Mexican-American. You know, uh, we're many different, different in so many ways you wouldn't believe. And yet we become the closest of friends and collaborators. Because I think we each, and, and that's part of the mestizaje, to recognize, recognize difference, but it's contributing. Uh, and so we don't try to eliminate that difference. In fact, we celebrate it. We celebrate it. So I, I think that's, uh, and I think his book is, is just a fascinating book, but I'd rather not take time from the other two respondents, uh, that really deepens, that really continues to deepen that conversation, that conversation on people's coming together. It's a world reality today. In fact, I'll finish with this phrase. One of the men who was a papabili but didn't, evidently didn't get it, the, the cardinal from Venice, uh, had, had just called in a very interesting article. Had just called that what's needed today is a mestizaje between Christianity and Islam. Now I found that to be an incredibly radical statement, you know, from a man who's actually quite conservative in many other ways. But as he said, he simply said, it's a reality. That people are living in the same space, they're marrying, they're having children. We need to talk about it in a positive way. So anyway, I'm. Um, just happy to be here with Jack and David and my other good friends here, Olga and John Philip. So I think basta for a moment. Thank you. I can keep going. Yeah. It, it seems that whenever Virgilio Elizondo comes here and we're together, we're always fortunate that John Santos shows up. Uh, and he's here again kind of as a surprise. John Santos was the first Mexican-American named as a Rhodes Scholar in the history of the United States. Um, he went on to a career not only of writing, but filmmaking. He became an enabler of artists and filmmakers from his work at the Ford Foundation. As a matter of fact, he's the person that enabled us to make the Alambrista director's cut. He guided us through the process of making the application, uh, and he used his own weight there to make sure that we were funded uh, to make Alambrista the director's cut. Uh, his, uh, his great success as a writer so far has been the wonderful memoir, Places Left Unfinished at the Time of Creation, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. He's presently writing his next novel, which we're very much looking forward to, uh, and he's been thinking about Mestizaje in many ways for some time. John, it's great to have you here, bro. Merci, David. Uh, it is a great honor to be here tonight. Uh, I came up really to join in the celebration. It's rare when you get a chance to celebrate the work of your guru's guru. In, in Hindu tradition, this is a very high honor. And to be in the house of yet another guru, uh, it's a very auspicious occasion for me. And, uh, and also just a great cause for celebration, the sense that, that it's inevitable that books have their time and that books appear in a particular time for, for very powerful reasons. Um, yesterday, finding myself paralyzed uh, in front of the television set, seeing... Pope Benedict XVI, uh, thought, thinking I heard the soundtrack, the Darth Vader soundtrack from Star Wars playing, and 
and then realizing that I still had a few chapters of Jacques' book to read. It was a great antidote to the uh, recent developments. And but I think even more profoundly uh, appears in this time for, for us and, and for, I hope, the, the great readership this book is going to gather. Um, the book, in, in many respects, is a kind of prolegomena that we've been waiting for, for, for a, a much broader way of thinking about mestizo identity, mestizo studies, Mestizo hermeneutic. Um, it, it is so all encompassing that, that uh, we can barely touch on the scope of, of the book's references, uh, not only for their great uh, and, and uh, very considerable scholarship, the uh, Cornelius de Pau discussion and the, the fascinating discussion of the uh, exchange between de Tocqueville and, and Gobineau, but it also includes references to. Talvin Singh's Asian Dub Foundation and Dub Culture in London. It has a passing reference to uh, Hillary Clinton's politics. So it is a, a, a vast uh, palette that, that, that uh, Jacques has brought before us. Um, and I remember the first time I heard him pronounce this, this phrase, uh, the human face of globalization, which is maybe about four years ago at a gathering in San Antonio, uh, when we were looking at, at, uh, at the impact of Virgil's work. Um, and that moment still echoes in my head because it, in, in many respects, put me on a path as a storyteller to think about mestizo identity in the context of global identity. Um, I grew up in the foment of the Chicano period in San Antonio and sort of the afterglow of that period. And deep into that story was this mythic um, overlay of, of an identity for Chicanos that, that sought to proclaim a homeland in, in the lands that we had grown up in, in Texas and Arizona, New Mexico, California, a kind of new homeland of Aslan. And that had always seemed very important, very powerful to me, but not sufficient, not adequate to really deal with the profound nature of the story that we were carrying as Mexican-Americans, as Mexicans, as mestizos. And I think Vir uh, Virgil and, and Jacques' work, and, and this book particularly, uh, brings into focus the nature of mestizo identity as a global identity, one that is certainly a powerful lens for looking at the present time, but echoes deep into the past. One of the biggest uh, disputes right now in paleoanthropology is whether we are, as a species, descended from a single line of modern humans, or whether there was a deep mestizaje, an early man mestizaje, in which there were perhaps as many as uh, two dozen simultaneously existing early human species that themselves uh, created a mestizaje. And then it, as, as um, Jacques points to in a number of very powerful passages in the book, is a, a kind of a lens into the future. How do we think about where mestizaje is taking us? Um, so the book is, is I think, uh, extremely important for um, students of mestizaje in that it gives us a very, a very uh, thoroughgoing, encapsulated history of the mestizo body, of, of mestizo um, uh, identity as it was... Uh, reckoned both before the conquest of the Americas and since. Um, that's, a, that's a story that has been little told, and, and one of the remarkable things for me in reading Jacques' book was the extent to which it has been completely left out of, of the picture in terms of historical research. And I think uh, Jacques' work on that, on that note is just really extraordinary. And he does it so deftly, he does it so poetically. He's always deferring to poets in this book uh, on, various, on various accounts, but this book is, is extremely poetic and it's not only its composition, but it's, an imagina it's imaginary uh, uh, processes. And it's also beautifully translated. Um, he captures for us also the drama of the mestizaje. David um, mentioned the, the inescapable element of violence in the mestizo story, both in terms of, of rape and conquest but also just the, the uncertainty, the, the chaos of mestizo identity itself as, as it is birthed in the Americas and begins to resonate um, globally. Uh, it also uh, gives us a sense of the genealogy of ideas of mestizaje, again, a kind of a prolegomena for how we enter into um, what is, in a sense, uh, a neglected or repressed epic of human identity, um, 
one that, that uh, has always been present. In fact, uh, as, as Virgil's book title mentions, the future is mestizo, the past was also mestizo. Um, and, uh, and we have uh, overlaid mythic stories of, of ancestries and genealogies to find ways to repress that story. And, and Jacques' book um, gives us an extraordinary birthing of a new way of, of lensing this. Um, he asks very profoundly in one, one moment whether uh, there can be a theory of mestizaje. Uh, and I think that that's, that's really where this book lands, at the doorstep of that theory. It, it, it opens in so many directions. It, it brings in elements of biology, natural history, uh, history itself, politics, science. It, it really um, it grounds the idea of mestizaje as a human face for globalization in, um, in this very simple question of who are we? Where did we come from? How, how did we become who we are? And for me as a storyteller, that is the underlying uh, beacon. It's the, it's the question that's always drawing forth stories of very ordinary families in South Texas or North Mexico uh, who carry with them very deep roots in the indigenous past on, on one side and in the global past, whether in Iberia or North Africa or Asia, the, the real reckoning of the theme of the raza cosmica, of a cosmic race. So um, uh, Jacques' work in, in many ways has helped me to see that while Mexicans have been very conscious of their mestizo past, that we've really just begun to, to plumb that, that very profound story of, of, of these origins. Um, I just want to end uh, on a note that, that, um, that uh, Jacques points to in a couple of instances, <clears throat> very generously talking about the role of, of um, both historians and, um, and the role of, of others in, in bringing this, this story forward. He says, uh, bit by bit, this is from the chapter called Mestizaje Recognized, <clears throat> bit by bit the work of anthropologists and biologists reconstructs how things reached their present state, whereas only poets are capable of sketching the outlines of an unknown future. Um, and it's that element, that, that great generosity about pointing to the role of poets and of the imagination in envisioning where the mestizo story is going. In the last couple of months, I've I've uh, read a couple of books that, that sort of gave me other beacons towards this future horizon. One is, is the Mary Doria Russell book, Children of God, which is a, a book about interplanetary travel where a group of Jesuits are sent to a, a planet uh, as experts in encountering the other. Um, they, uh, they are sent to this planet, and it's a very profound exploration of mestizaje in the context of this interplanetary world. Uh, and another film, which Virgil and I have talked about, um, uh, I, well, this is a film, not a, not a book, um, Michael Winterbottom's recent movie called Code 46, which I would commend to you upon after, after reading of Jacques' book. Um, and this is a, a sci-fi film as well, a sci-fi story set in the near future. Uh, not much is really told to you about what has taken place in the world, uh, but you're following the story of an investigator played by Tim Robbins, who goes to Shanghai, which is apparently now in a desert. Uh, the lead character is named Monica Gonzalez, uh, but she's played by Samantha Morton, a, a Scottish <laughs> actress. And the script is written in a combination of Spanish, English, Arabic, and French. And it imagines a, a globalized world in the undetermined near future, in which, uh, in order to reproduce, everyone has to be genetically screened. And to, uh, to be allowed to reproduce, uh, you have to be sufficiently distant from one another in genetic terms. So in a sense, it's become a kind of global fascist mestizaje. You must, you must be mestizo to reproduce. It's a very interesting uh, shift in lots of the context that we've become familiar with in, in our dialogue over the years. Um, but it, it poses the story of the emerging role that is going to be a profound development in our times of the DNA codex. We each carry with us uh, an exhaustive uh, record of our mestizaje. 
And it's a, it's a, scientific, vernac- a scientific language, but it's, it's going to verge increasingly towards a vernacular. And we're going to be presented with full scripts, in a sense, of our mestizo past. So questions of what we will do with that, what we will do with that story of, of our profoundly mixed uh, origins uh, in light of the very dear national cultural identity stories that we carry. Um, I think I will just end there. Thank you. Very good. As a way of uh, bringing Olga Garza Kaufman on, let me just read for you very quickly just a couple of lines from the book so that you can get another sense of the kind of commitment that uh, Jacques Aroné is making. In a chapter called The Vocabulary of Mestizaje, he writes, Mestizaje becomes a value and carries with it new resources. Then he writes, In summary, this word, still rarely used despite advances and almost forbidden in daily conversation, is an alarm. Raising the subject of mestizaje is getting close to a danger zone, a suspect area, one of those subjects that aren't mentioned in polite company. The word will travel a long road before it gets positive connotation and designates one of the richest facets of the human adventure. This story is worth telling. Later in the chapter, mestizaje thus becomes a means for classifying human beings and determining the power plays between them. And then he says, situations referred to as mestizo are multiplying and gaining increasing acceptance. And then finally, the the marginal becomes the center. The word mestizo is being charged with radically new meaning emotion, and potential. The word mestizaje and associated words redefined can help us more than any others to designate what the stakes are in the multicultural situations of our societies. It has the advantage of focusing attention on what is dynamic in the processes at work. Its multiple itineraries indicate how identities are forged, diversity born, and also at what price. Our final respondent is Olga Garza Kaufman, who was born in Mexico in the state of Taumaulipas and was reared in South Texas. Her family of 10 worked on ranches and farms in South Texas, and she did farm or farm work in North Dakota and Minnesota. Olga began school in a separate Mexican school in Texas and finished high school with the third highest GPA in that district. She attended the University of Texas at Austin and graduated from St. Mary's University with a degree in biology. After working in a children's psychiatric hospital, a women's employment training program, and as a pharmaceutical sa- afterward, and as a pharmaceutical sales agent, Olga began work as a grant maker with the Levi Strauss Foundation. Olga has been a board member and officer of many nonprofit organizations, such as the Women's Employment Network, Hispanas Unidas, the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, and the San Antonio Children's Museum. Presently, Olga is concentrating on coordinating and funding programs to train displaced garment workers in San Antonio and help them find and keep gainful employment. So, Olga, we thank you for that work and the kind of example you set for us and for coming tonight to share with us your response. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that kind introduction. Um, I'll have to admit, when I first uh, saw the title of this book, um, I didn't think of being mestizo or mestizaje. I thought about it in economic terms. Because everybody that talks about globalization, it's always about politics and economy. In my work, in my work, that's, that's what I do. I work with women who are primarily Chicanas, who have been dealt 
a pretty lousy hand by globalization. They're mostly women that have been displaced in the garment industry in the United States, mainly in, in Texas. So when I looked at that, that's what I thought about. But then once I, read it, I started reading the book, I was pleasantly surprised because it took me back to my old college days in San Antonio and at the university, uh, at St. Mary's University. And I started thinking about, I also grew up in those heady days after the Chicano movement where um, I was a proud Aswanista and proud of being a Chicana and I uh, love to read Octavio Paz and, and the history of, of, of how our people were born. They were born in violence. And uh, so I tried to kind of think about that part of it, the intellectual, cultural, and poetic side of it, and then the very practical, uh, professional reality of what globalization is. And then I was pleasantly surprised to learn that in Europe they're talking about mestizos and they're talking about mestizaje, and it's, it's a reality really everywhere in the world. And I had always thought of it as only something that happened in the Americas. There was a, a, a clash of cultures in the Americas, and a new people was created. So I never really thought about, hey, the rest of the world, the same thing happened. Everybody has borders. Everybody, a lot of people are a mixture of, of two cultures. And how do we handle that now that it's happening and we're recognizing it in the whole world? And I think that uh, Jacques Adonai brings a lot of sensitivity and he brings a lot of the, the poetic to his book and talks about the culture and how the effect that, that uh, Messi Hase has on the culture, how it makes it better. And uh, being a biology major, I could relate to the part that, where he talks about biology. When you, in biology, when you create a hybrid, you're working to create. It's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. You're working to create something better. And looking at, at Looking at it that way, it's hard to imagine that uh, there have been people in history and today that consider mestizaje a negative, like the whole writings of, Gab of Gobineau. I've, I found that very, very uh, fascinating. And some of his writings went on to inspire, you know, Hitler. And so... So fortunately, there was Tocqueville to to bring in the the other side of it. So so I enjoyed uh, reading about that. But I kept thinking about the human face of globalization and trying to think what is it going to look like in the future, and how do we want it to look like? And I think that when you, when you talk about mestizaje, mestizaje and how it was born of violence. In a lot of ways, um, the violence continues, and you can see it in the faces of the women that I work with that have lost their jobs and have, have lost everything or losing their families because of something that is happening somewhere else in the world and because they are powerless and there are other powers that direct how their, how their life continues. So... So I think that we also need to look at that part of it. I, the culture and the poetry and all of that, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. And I, of course, 100% agree with it. And, and I would love to just continue. I could talk about it all night long. But then I think about the practical aspects of globalization and, and how we can, yes, we can, I think Mr. Adeno has, has taken a giant big step in just writing this book, and I thank him for it, because we can discuss it, and it can become a scholarly subject, and it can become, it can be out there, uh, and it can be appreciated. But then we have the really mundane, practical things about mestizaje that we have to deal with, and that is that this situation still exists. There are still people that are powerless just because of who they are and where they come from. And they have no economic power. They, uh, they feel alienated. They feel le they are left out from the mainstream of society. And so I think that, that part of that really 
is the part that maybe needs to be addressed, maybe not by this, the scholars that are here, but maybe other, other people that, that, that work in, in the area of politics and economics. But as far as um, discussing this book, as, as a woman and, a, and as, as a mestizo and a Chicana, I, I can thoroughly appreciate it, and I could relate to it from the point of view of having read um, Father Elizondo's book, The Future is Mestizo. He talks about, actually, there's different kinds of mestizaje. There's uh, mestizos in Mexico where we were formed from the, the clash of cultures of the <coughs> Spanish and the indigenous people of Mexico. But then we have another kind, which is um, another level, which is mestizos living in a different culture in America. And that those are totally different issues that, that come up. And, and as a Chicana, I can, I can relate to a lot of those issues. I'm, even though I was born in Mexico, I'm, I'm very far removed from, from that reality. And uh, my reality is living as a Chicana in America. And, um, and it's totally different when I read about mestizaje in Mexico and, and what I read about in, in books. So I thought about this, all these different things, and, and so then I thought, well, you know, what does that, what does that make my children? And, I, and, and um, Mr. Adino addresses that in several, several of his chapters. He talks about the children of mestizos, because I, I am a mestizo and I'm married to, to an American. So my children are, I think, I like to think, and I always say that what, what Jose Vasconcelos described as La raza cósmica, and I think that's just a very romantic notion, but, but I like to think of the la raza cósmica, which is a totally different um, human that I think will carry us forward, and I think they too are the, the, the future face of um, glo globalization. So I, I think that I, I looked at this book from the personal, which is um, I identified with it as a Chicana, and I identified with it as a mother. And, and then it also opened up a whole lot of questions about the practical political side and the, um, the uh, economic side of, of globalization. And, and it just brought up a lot of questions that uh, I am really looking forward to discussing with, with uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Adine. Adine. Thank you. So the powerful question, what does that make my children? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, we, we, there's food after this, right? There's food. But, but you've got to speak up. You can't, you can't go have some food unless you at least raise your hand, even if I don't call on you. So it's time to have some, some questions, either some responses here to Jacques. I don't know if you want to respond, but we'd really like to hear from Yes. Uh, to give my credentials, I mean, the Ethnic Studies uh, Committee of Arts and Sciences here, I'm also in the African African American Studies Department, so my, my question comes from that framework, though, so obviously I'm not black myself. Um, which is, why is it this sort of one more version of everybody gets to become white except us? Us, in this thing, speaking as a black American. You know, we saw this before when the Irish became white, we saw this before, you know, with the resilience are whitening as a consequence of getting lighter in skin color and a little higher in the class. This is a, you know, this not is a way of, sort of not being black, etc. I mean, I'm caricaturing that position. Oh, sorry. I'm caricaturing that position, but I think some more sophisticated or subtle version of it is a very serious concern uh, within some, not all, of the African American community and more generally among people who do think in terms of the traditional sort of black-white binary. So how do you get around that position? Anybody? 
I don't know. But I think, you know, I don't know because I think it's, it's very deeply ingrained in our consciousness to think in terms of the, of the either or. You know, I think it's very deeply... And that's why I say, I don't know, an easy way. For example, myself, I didn't choose to be who I am. I was born. And I sought to understand who I am. You know, and I think out of the quest for self-understanding, and I saw that within, within the mestizo reality, for example, uh, all they would call themselves more mulatos, but you take the, the, the Afro-American Latinos, who sometimes have a lot of difficulty when they join the military because they sign up as Spanish-speaking, uh, but the military would classify them as African-American, uh, but they don't speak English, you know. Or so you have the Afro-Brazilians, and, and so they then find much more with, with the mulates, which would be what I would call the, the mestizo. Uh, so I, I, I think it's a struggle because I think we, we learn so much from the black experience and the black struggles and, and respect it and admire it. Uh, the whole thing of, you know, black is beautiful. And we push that to also the mestizo. Mestizo is beautiful. You know, but in the mestizo notion, you break through. And I think maybe Professor Carrasco might, I know he responded to that issue beautifully yesterday at another conference we were together at Notre Dame. Because uh, I think that is an issue, and I think that's somewhat of a fear of the mestizo. The mestizo kind of makes a breakthrough, because the mestizo can be white and black, and the, the raza cosmica. Uh, I think part of the mestizaje reality is that you have uh, every bit of the color spectrum, one extreme to the other, and of, of the cultural ethnic. And yet there's a certain profound unity. You play Latino music, and you have the unity. Uh, and so I, I, I think, but I think maybe, I don't know if I can put David on the spot or maybe somebody else will answer, because I, I think he, he gave a marvelous insight into the very question you posed yesterday. Um, thank you. The, I appreciate the, the project and the work that you're doing. And I just wanted to make sure that I'm understanding it correctly in light of her conversation. How does it become um, uh, a conversation about, one, you know, becoming, um, uh, moving out of one space and becoming, uh, you know, partakers in a particular benefit of whiteness or, 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 or in that kind of line? I'm understanding the project as being very transgressive and undermining this notion of of, of um, benefits of this um, bifurcated understanding of identity. Um, when you start talking about uh, remembering or, um, the future, or if, I, if that's the, 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 the correct, remembering the future, in some ways the metesage or the metesake reinterprets that very destructive construction of identity that resulted in whiteness or blackness. That it's, it's, it's saying, listen, that was, that's a myth in and of itself. And that the, um, this, this whole notion of, of a Western uh, um, identity is in and of itself um, predicated upon radical hybridity and this, 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 this confluence of various cultural and, and ethnic diversity that for a variety of, of, of reasons becomes very simplistically understood. Well, this is what whiteness is. And over and against that, this is what blackness is. It's always been far more complicated. That's what I'm understanding you to say, to be saying. Am I right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you are, excuse me, you are right. We, we cannot say this is, this is a pure mestizo, so this is a white. This is, you know, what I, why I, what I want to, to show, you know, is that the categories we use in order to identify ourselves, you know, are historical categories, are relative categories. We need those categories, but we, we, we cannot not use them. But at the same time, we, have, we are in a process of questioning them permanently. You know, uh, last month I wrote an article which had been asked uh, by a group of, by, by a periodical in France called Africulture. You know, it's a, it's a magazine who publishes works of artists in Africa. And they, they, they will have a special issue on mestizaje. And they asked me for an, an article on the ambiguity of the concept of mestizaje, you know. Because mestizaje is not the new concept which solves all the problem of the other concept of identity. We have to be careful in that. And I'm not apologizing about mestizaje. Just I'm trying to, to pay 
to, to make people pay attention to the fact that whatever be the concept we use, you know, they are relative, they are mobile, you know, and that identity cannot never be defined. The identity of human beings is much broader than any concept we can use, you know. You know, in, in the book, uh, Jacques actually uses a term uh, in several places uh, of deracination, a kind of a process that is describing, in a sense, a kind of um, auto deconstruction. It's it's autobiographical, but it it's a, a an imaginary process, a, a critical imaginary process, and it's one that, in species terms, probably is going to be with us for you know many centuries to come. Uh, this this way of understanding ourselves is so deeply imprinted in our codes of culture and society. Um, it's it's interesting <coughs> though to to begin in, in the visionary spirit in which the book is written to, to look towards a horizon, in a sense, where uh, in, the, in the aftermath, in a sense, of these identities, um, imagining that we have a, 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 a possible way of, of at least coming to terms consciously with, with their operation, their construction in our, in our imaginations, in our memories, in our way of being family and um, creating society, uh, what then do we make of the stories that we carry? You know, what do they signify? What, where do they belong in, in, our, in our species story? Where, where are we going to place the story about being Mexican? If, if Mexicanness um, over the wash of time becomes increasingly uh, you know, recognized as illusory, mythic, uh, projective, imaginary, what, what does that story tell us, though? In, in a lot of the, the conversations we've had over these last years, it's, it's a, a sense more of a kind of a, a prophetic role that these stories have. These stories bring us back to something prophetic. Um, you had a lot of people lining up here. Here's one, and here's one, and here's one. Let me just say, in terms of this question, when I was a kid going up in Washington, D.C., there was, you were in this room, and there were these two doorways that you could go out, and one doorway said colored, and the other said white, and that's all there was. Mm-hmm. And you're in this room, and that's where you can go. You can do colored and white. Now, I was raised pretty, pretty uh, I was hip enough to know I was going to go through the colored doorway. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what my father, and so I knew I was and how I was treated. So I said, I'm going through the colored doorway. You know? uh, but the, what the Mehdi Sahi is saying is those aren't the only two doorways. Uh, and, but the other doorway is it's not, it's not easy to make. But in fact, people are trying to make this doorway without denying that the other two doorways are there. And we're probably a little bit over closer to the colored doorway. Uh, but in fact, you, you know, just because you choose a new doorway doesn't mean you're saying, hey, man, I don't go for black. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean what it, necessarily what it says. Okay, right here. Are you talking? Okay, right here. Dr. Parra. Uh, thank you. This is a question for uh, Professor Odine. I've been working the last four years in the border between Latino homes and schools in a district here in, uh, in Boston. And uh, we have realized the hard work that needs to be done to bridge that gap between home and school. And when I heard you talking about this invitation that you got from the hospitals uh, at Paris, I was wondering if you have gotten any invitation from the Ministry of Education to work on those cultural issues between home and schools. No, no, I personally or, did not receive that kind of invitation, but there are several groups working on that, you know. Uh-huh. And do you know more or less what are but, they doing? But, or? Yeah, but many of the groups who work on that in many countries, you know, they usually, few of them work from the point of view of Mestizaje, because the hypothesis we have in our country, especially in Europe, about the, the differences between people, is that the only way to survive for the society is to deny those differences. We are, we are all, e- all of us, we are equal, we are the same citizens of the same country. Therefore, the differences belong to, to the individual realm of the personality. When we are in command, of course, we have all of us, we are citizens. Therefore, there is no problem at the citizenship level, you know. But the problem comes at the personal level. That's psychological. But there are very few works, you know, who try to deal with the collective situation. And we have a lot of problem of that in France, for instance, uh, about the, with the Muslims. Maybe you heard about all those discussions about the veils in the classroom, you know. Should the Muslim girls wear or not their veils, you know. The answer was, they are French citizens, therefore they don't 
where they veil in school, you know. They, they wear it when, whenever they want, uh, outside of school, at, at home, or in the city, but not in school. But that's not, that does not solve the problem, you know. We, which, we have to question the hypothesis which is behind that, of course. The citizenship is the same for everybody. But should not exist the citizenship which accept the differences, n not only differences of phrases, differences of culture. And we have not found that. Yeah, one more, then we're going to continue this across the street with the food. So you get to go eat, uh, you get to go eat. <laughs> I really want to eat also, so <laughs> I had to make up a question. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, all your commentaries. I myself am Canadian and French and French-Canadian. When I'm in Montreal, they say I'm French. When I'm in Paris, they say I'm Canadian. So <laughs> I, I understand this métissage, uh, métissage. Um, so, and, and I really like the... the, the I, I've I'm also a student in philosophy and here at the Divinity School. And so the, the problem of the either or is really a big problem, I think, to understand uh, our being, our identity. And you were saying also that identity is not something that can be definitive, that is always in progress, that is always dynamic. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more here about the idea of becoming, because I think that it's not because I'm mixed or I have these two cultures within me that I'm, I'm all set up. I, it's always if I go live in India for 20 more years, I'll become also a little bit Indian. So, so this idea of becoming and this idea of maybe of mystery that I've come across, because we, we never, if we can never uh, fully grasp uh, with our categories the, the, the identity or the reality of something, then what about the mystery? I think our new pope has difficulty to, um, well, that would be another story I will not enter here. But so, so just the idea of, uh, of becoming and mystery, if you wanted to say a few words about. Well, it's a very huge question, yes. you know, because we have to think about uh, the way in which in, w in the Western world the philosophical tradition has defined the individual as a person. You know. And of course it, it goes back to the Greeks. It goes through the whole Christian tradition. You know. And the person is a mystery, is something permanent persona means substance, you know, permanent substance. But the anthropological work shows us that this what is the relation between this supposed per permanency and the diversity we have to go through all our, our life long, you know. And I think it's a, it's a new, you know, that's a new philosophical field, you know, yeah. which has to be explored. Yeah. For me personally, uh, I'm trying to work on that through the categories I mentioned at the end, you know, time, space and body, which are for me the basic anthropological categories. Therefore, how to somehow, how to detect the permanency of one human being through time, space, and, uh, and body. What is permanent? What is not permanent? And the, the instrument to work with that is language. You know? We have a language of the past. We, we are telling our own story permanently and transforming our story. But what we say of the past does it correspond or not to what the past? Even in our own history, what our memories of our own history are faithful to the past and betray the past. Well, that is, that's the kind of question that comes around. And of course, you, you can suppose that we have some kind of uh, idealistic identity which is going through time, space, and body. You can imagine that. It gives a good idealistic philosophy. Okay, I have some trouble with that. I think we still haven't been able to uh, answer all the questions and the implications here. Certainly Olga's uh, wonderful and critical comments. Let's try to do that across the street. I want to thank the panel. Thanks, Jacques, for writing the book. All of you coming. Thank you. So the Center for the Study of World Religions right across the street. Let's go have a good time. <laughs>